Hi, Yuval. Hello. Thanks, Thanks for, for doing this. Uh, Thank you. Welcome to C-SPAN. I'm going to be uh, grilling you on your new book, The Great Debate. And uh, I'll try to do my best Brian Lamb, which means a lot of profanity. Um, and uh, um, we'll see where it goes. So let's just start right off the bat. Uh, who was Edmund Burke? Edmund Burke was uh, an Irish-born English politician, a uh, statesman, a political thinker and writer uh, in the late 18th century. He was born in 1729. He lived until 1797. Uh, his political career is really from the late 1760s until his death, and uh, it was an unusual political career in that it was also very much an intellectual career. Uh, from the very beginning, he was as much a thinker as a politician, and the thinking he did was about how to help his country through a period of intense change uh, and tension and crisis from the American War through a Regency crisis through the French Revolution and a European war that followed. Burke was a voice for sustaining continuity through change and so was uh, an enemy of the radicalism of the French Revolution but was a reformer of British institutions always in an effort to save them, to fix them. And so he's come to be known as one of the fathers of modern conservatism for this effort to try to sustain continuity uh, in times of change. Uh, Russell Kirk is sort of most famous for establishing him yeah. as the father of modern conservatism. Was he known as the father of modern conservatism before Kirk? Well, you know, Burke himself at the end of his life describes himself as belonging to the party of conservation. Uh, the term conservative didn't exist exactly. But uh, he understood himself to be engaged in the effort to save the British Constitution, the British system, uh, at a time when it was genuinely threatened by political radicalism. So it makes sense to think of him as a father of modern conservatism, but it can also be misleading. Burke was a Whig, not a Tory. Uh, he was a reformer, a reformer of institutions, of practices, an opponent of slavery, uh, and uh, 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 always favored limits on the power of the king, and so he, he wasn't a throne and altar conservative. He wasn't a person who would have been thought of as a conservative uh, in continental Europe at the right. time. But a voice for Anglo-American conservatism. He's been understood that way uh, before Kirk, yeah. Okay, and so who was Thomas Paine? Thomas Paine was uh, an English-born immigrant to America, uh, a contemporary of Burke's roughly. He was eight years younger. Um, and his story is quite different. He began, uh, he began life uh, in, in, a, in a working class family in England uh, through a, a series of uh, terrible misadventures, found himself uh, basically a bankrupt tax collector living in London trying to figure out what to do with his life, but one with an extraordinary self-education in philosophy and political thought uh, and science. And he encountered Benjamin Franklin, the, the representative of the American colonies in, uh, in Britain. And Franklin got to know him a little, very little, and uh, suggested to him that he should try going to America and starting over. Um, and Paine did that and very quickly became an important figure in the intellectual circles in Philadelphia. He was the editor of a small magazine called the Pennsylvania Magazine, uh, a writer. And as the American Revolution began to brew, he became a very important rhetorician in the struggle for independence. He wrote Common Sense, the great uh, pamphlet that persuaded so many people to uh, back the cause of independence. He wrote the Crisis Papers uh, and played a part. He was a, he, he, I think it's fair to call him a member of the founding generation. And 10 years later, uh, less known to us Americans, Paine went to France and became an important spokesman uh, for the French revolutionaries really their great champion to the English-speaking world. Uh, he made the case for the radicalism of the revolution in France to British and American audiences. He was, uh, he was a real revolutionary. He was a believer in the need to break with the past in order to undo the terrible injustices that the, the European regimes, in his view, were committing in their people. And um, he wanted always to find ways to apply the right political principles to society to arrive at uh, greater equality, greater individual liberty. And so it, we think of him as one of our founders, but he was more radical than the American Revolution was and in some ways was much more at home in the French Revolution. He's thought of as one of the fathers of modern radicalism and therefore in some respects of the modern left. Which brings us to the title of your book, The, the Great Debate. Yeah. So uh, can you explain where that title comes from and what was the essence of their debate? Yeah, so Burke and Paine, first of all, were engaged in an actual debate, especially around the French Revolution. Uh, both of them more or less were backers of American independence. Paine, of course, much more explicitly so than Burke, but Burke basically supported the Americans. 
Um, when it came to the French Revolution, they were on starkly opposite sides. They had a real debate. They knew each other. They met a few times, but they exchanged a fair number of letters. And most importantly, they answered one another's published writings. Uh, some of their most important writings were in response to one another. And um, what the book argues is that the debate actually predates that explicit debate, and that for a long time, really for the entirety of their public careers, the two of them were laying out two views of the liberal society, of what a free society could be like. And uh, the two are very much in tension with one another. They present very different ideas of what Anglo-American liberalism is, of, of where it's headed, of what its purpose is, of what it's founded in. And so it's a real argument about political philosophy that the book tries to draw out by putting their two world views against one another and not just by reading their actual explicit debate about the revolution. What you come away with are two coherent, consistent views of what we ought to be as free people in a free society, um, what English and American political life should be. And what I argue is that these are views that are identifiably conservative on the one hand and radical or progressive on the other, and so they can help us see to the bottom of some of the left-right debate that continues. Uh, the idea is not exactly that their, their relationship to today's left and right is somehow genealogical. It's not that, that today's conservatism is descended from Burke explicitly, but that these two kinds of views emerge almost inevitably in our kind of society, and that Burke and Payne express them more clearly and explicitly than we're used to seeing. So, and just for context, have there been other, I mean, can you think of other great thinkers on, at, on either side of the pressing issue of the day who had this kind of open air argument? I mean, one of the problems you get with intellectual history is you, you know, you say, gosh, I would love to know what John Dewey would say to Hayek on yeah. this, or what yeah. would, you know, and, uh, and this is one of these rare cases where you actually have that. Um, can you think of any others? It's a very rare thing. It, it, uh, there, are, there are a few others on a smaller scale also around the French Revolution. The French Revolution raised really profound questions, and at a time when there were people, both in Britain and in America, who were involved in politics who were serious political thinkers, uh, which is very unusual. And so you find some disputes between Jefferson and Adams, for example, that come, that, that, that come to seem a little bit like this debate. And there's a very broad public dispute, both in Britain and in America, about the French Revolution in general. But I think Burke and Payne, because they engaged each other so directly and because they disagreed so profoundly, and I also think because Burke, more than anyone who agreed with him, expressed the conservative vision of the liberal society explicitly and fully, uh, there aren't a lot of other voices like his. And so I think he's really what makes this debate uh, what it is. But Payne took him seriously and answered him specifically and felt that he owed it to his, to his readers and, and friends to address Burke's arguments. And so you really have a debate, a, a full-on debate. Right, so we should probably get some terminology stuff out of the way. First yeah. of all, um, the French Revolution is widely seen as, actually the, the, the terms left and right yeah. come out of the French Assembly. That's right. right? Um, and it had to do with the the seating chart and the chart exactly. right? and the more so basically the people who supported the the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was the really uh, radical statement of principles of the French Revolution, uh, more or less sat to the left of the speaker in the original assembly. The people on the right were a little they were still revolutionaries, but they were a little bit less radical. And so in the press at the time, both in Britain and in France, they came to be referred to as left and right. And so radicals on the left, uh, more conservatives on the right. Right. I mean, I, I've always bristled at this a little bit because this is a European import, right? Exactly. And that in the British Parliament, uh, the, the seating chart went basically with the yeas and nays, essentially, and, right. and it moved around depending who was in power. Exactly. And so we never actually had the same category. Yeah, the government sits to the right of the Speaker in the Commons, still does, um, and the opposition party on the left. Uh, it, it, it's a problem in more ways than that because, in fact, the left and right of the French Revolution have very little to do with our left and right. Uh, it's true that one of them was more radical than the other, but the, the idea that left and right come from the French Revolution is more wrong than it is right. Uh, the actual parties to the French Revolution, the sort of the, the, the aristocrats and the Girondists, and the, they don't have anything to do with our politics. They don't really have anything to do with anyone's politics anymore. Where you really find left and right as we recognize them emerging is in the politics of Britain and America around the same time. So I think it's right to say that left and right emerged around the French Revolution, but they really emerged in a debate about the French Revolution, a debate that was basically held.